Uh, let me introduce Micronesia for those of you to whom it is a new area. If we go east from Taiwan, we will see all these wonderful islands and uh, the area between uh, Taiwan and Hawaii is generally a large area scattered with beautiful islands and it's all generally called Micronesia. But within that area, as you see, many different islands, many different languages, and now many different nations. The history of Micronesia goes back thousands of years, and although I will not talk about the ancient history, I know that you here in Taiwan have archaeologists and historians who are experts in that history. Uh, you probably know that Micronesia was settled by people sailing on large um, canoes across the Pacific. Their early uh, houses and buildings were of stone with wood on top, and the archaeology of this area is just becoming known. So those of you young people who are interested in archaeology, this is a wonderful field of study that is just opening up. The area of Micronesia, when it was encountered by uh, Chinese, Japanese, and then European uh, travelers, came under the control of a series of colonial rulers. Just briefly, let me mention them, because each of these colonial rulers left an impact on the islands. So uh, Spain was the first European colonial ruler, and you still see on Pompeii, this is a remnant of a Spanish wall. Uh, Germany controlled parts of the area until World War I, and you see on the left, again in Pompeii, that is a German Protestant church that has been abandoned. Then Japan, and I will talk more about this era, which you are all familiar with, because like Taiwan, these areas of Micronesia were under Japanese rule during the time of the Japanese Empire. And then at the end of World War II, when Japan lost those possessions, the United States became uh, the political power in the region. I also mentioned the British control of Kiribati, the Gilbert Islands, and of course here I should include Nauru. Um, just a picture of the Japanese governor's uh, house in Yap, and I like uh, for historians you will enjoy the layers of history. It's built on top of the old Spanish fort in that area. The period of Japanese rule is uh, a period that is of such importance in understanding Micronesia as it is for mus much of East Asia. Uh, Japan took over the region under a League of Nations mandate um, at the end of World War I and established its colonial policy, which was similar to that uh, that was established here in Taiwan although um, there, were, there was less potential for economic development in these small islands, and there was a great interest on the part of Japan in encouraging immigration, especially from Okinawa, into these islands. So the language and culture of the islands, although they were preserved in the long term, during this period they were under great pressure to become Japanese in language and culture. The civil administration, by that I mean before the wartime, um, lasted until 1939 in most places. And you still see um, in Micronesia some of the buildings, um, some of the changes in the landscape uh, that were created. Like the Japanese policy throughout its empire, there were schools, although in Micronesia, uh, local people were only allowed to attend uh, elementary school and then technical school. They were not allowed to attend high school or university. There was health care throughout the islands. There was a great increase in shipping and trade with islanders producing dried fish, uh, mats, um, seaweed, uh, different kinds of small-scale products. And then there was also, and I know you are familiar with this, a very efficient police force throughout the islands.
When older people in Micronesia remember the Japanese era, these are the good things they remember. The stores, the shipping, the education, the discipline, the health care. And they also remember uh, very fondly their personal relationships with uh, Japanese immigrants. As you will see, much of this positive feeling about the Japanese era shifted when the military took control and the war uh, became the dominant part of life. Before the war, throughout Micronesia, the Japanese expanded the colonial economy. I know many of these uh, pictures will be familiar to you from your own history uh, books, but it is interesting to see the similarities, even on these small islands of Micronesia, in how the Japanese colonial uh, empire uh, expanded and developed the local economy. Here you can see the impact of immigration over the years. Now you have to remember that these are very small islands with tens of thousands of people, not millions of people, uh, with uh, 20 or 50 square miles, not hundreds of square miles. So the impact of these a large number of immigrants on the local area was very strong, uh, a very powerful change in people's lives. By the end of the Japanese civilian administration, 1936-1937, there were parts of Micronesia where islanders had lost most of their land or had lost the ability to control what happened to their land. So uh, many historians have wondered what would have happened in Micronesia if the war had not taken place. We can't really speculate, but when we talk to the older people, they feel that um, they face the choice of either losing control of their land completely or abandoning their culture and becoming Japanese in order to retain control of their land. This idea of acculturation, as the anthropologists call it, where one culture uh, becomes adapted to another culture, uh, was a very important part of Japanese policy. Here you see on Yap, you have a Japanese teacher who would have been part of the um, civil service, uh, a professional civil service of Japanese of, uh, officials working throughout Micronesia, uh, teaching a group of children on Yap. When, if you were to visit much of Micronesia today, you would find the older people speaking pretty good Japanese. And um, in fact, they miss not being able to speak Japanese. So uh, now that it is easier to get um, internet contact or media, you find some people enjoying reading Japanese newspapers and keeping in touch uh, with the, the language they learned when they were children. Other things that continued to shape Micronesian society from Japanese acculturation are things like sports teams, uh, fashion, clothing, uh, style of life, where people began to eat much more rice, to eat uh, Japanese style foods, to dress Japanese fashion, to use Japanese words in their own language. Um, and there was just a, a strong interest and a strong pressure to develop a Japanese lifestyle throughout Micronesia. The urban centers were dominated by the immigrants, Japanese, Okinawan, Korean immigrants, um, and they looked very much like the pictures of small town Japan in the 1930s. Um, and as you will see, most of these areas were destroyed by American bombing during the war, but um, they were uh, large for the islands, uh, bustling, busy, urban centers. The one part of uh, Micronesia that was not a part of the Japanese Empire before the war was Guam, which the Americans owned since 1898. And I want to remind you uh, of it because it's a, a different part of Micronesia. Uh, in Guam, um, the major shaping culture was American culture. Uh, the land was mostly used for rural farming. The Catholic Church was th the dominant religious impact, and the U.S. Navy was also a very strong impact. So Guam was in a very different situation in 1939. Uh, people spoke English. They considered themselves Americans. 
Um, they felt very far from the United States, but they definitely felt that they were a part of the American culture. So if you see that picture of a high school graduation in 1927, it looks very much like a group of young rural Americans. Here is Agana, Guam, the biggest city on Guam, just on the eve of war. I want to show you this because I really want to make the contrast between a part of the world uh, where life was fairly pleasant, where ec the economy was developing, where people were facing cultural pressure to change, but they were dealing with it, they were adapting to it, um, and people had a very hopeful outlook about life. When I talk to older people about the start of the war, they emphasize how the expectations they had and the hopes they had for their lives were abruptly brought to an end. So the Pacific War, World War II, it just marks a huge change in everyone's life in that region. I know that's obvious because it marked a change for everyone in the world. But in Micronesia, it was a sort of double change. Not only the changes brought about by the war, but also the dramatic change in their political situation before and after the war. Before I go on to talk about how I learned about the war in Micronesia then, let me look, talk a little about why I began to study the war in Micronesia. My background begins in Micronesia with a very different kind of research interest. When I graduated from, um, when I attended graduate school, my main interest was in very traditional anthropological topics like human environment relations, ethnicity, uh, kinship, social organization. And my first research in the late 1970s, early 1980s was in Pohnpei, which is part of the Federated States of Micronesia, and a very beautiful place if you have a chance to visit. And then on a small island that was an overnight boat trip away from Pohnpei. Now let me show you those two differences, because if you're not familiar with Micronesia, you might not know that there are two different kinds of islands. The high islands, which are volcanic based and are fairly large, have a large population. And then the atolls, which are very small and have a small population um, and are just little sandbars on the ocean, very tiny. So this was a very traditional anthropological study that I did on Sabwafik. Uh, I studied ethnography, which means a description of the local culture, and I described everything from uh, life and death. The bottom is a funeral for an elderly woman. Um, the right is a young woman with her new baby. Uh, to people's politics, their social organization. On the left you see people pounding sakao or kava, which is a traditional um, habit and pastime in the Pacific. So I did a very general ethnographic study describing the culture and as I did I learned something I had not known because no one had written about it. This small island had had its population almost completely destroyed by an attack by British and American um, pirates I guess we would call them uh, in 1837. And as a result, the new population had started over again at that time. I said to myself, why did nobody write about this? <laughs> why is this not uh, widely known? And the answer is that there are many islands and there have not always been scholars writing about them. But since I was there, I became what, the scholar to record this history. So I talked to the older people who had heard stories from their grandparents and I uh, wrote the oral history. When I got back, I went to the library and I found that I had to go into archives in order to find out the uh, Western history of these British and American sailors who had attacked the island. So uh, the result, I include uh, Mr. Uh, Lawrence, who was one of the primary people that told me what he had learned from his grandparents. And you see some of the older women there who were very generous in sharing what they knew. The result was that I wrote a book on the Natchik Massacre. Natchik is the old name for that island, Sapwafik. And I became very interested in how history shaped people's identity. Because when these people talked about themselves, even though they shared the same language as Pohnpei, even though they looked like Pohnpeians, they thought of themselves as very different because of their different history. 
So I became interested in history and identity as a subject of study. My next project in Micronesia was very different in some ways, but took me to the same end result. It was in the Marshall Islands. And I know some of you have been to the Marshall Islands. You know that it's a series of atolls. Um, the one on the bottom right is Majuro, which is very well populated, overpopulated, some people say, uh, for such a small island. And I was invited to come and help the Alele Museum, which is the National Museum of the Marshall Islands, to do training in how to record traditions and uh, historical culture. So I took a, a small plane and we went to one of the faraway islands, Maloalap. Um, those of you, oops, let me see if I can do that again for you. Perhaps if any of you have read your World War II history, you know the name Maloalap, but it was one of the Japanese air bases during the war. Now it's a very quiet place, luckily. But the remains of the war uh, still exist. That's a pillbox you see on the right of the lagoon. And because very few people return to Malawalap after the war to live, there is an entire islet, Tarwa Islet in Malawalap, which has only about 60 people living on it, but has the remains of a complete World War II era air base. It has never been completely cleared away. So the uh, Department of History um, of the Republic of the Marshall Islands wondered whether they should make this a national historical park, whether it could become a tourist attraction, the way Bikini Atoll, oddly enough, has become a tourist attraction. So uh, they invited me to come and help them put together a research study on that question. So the first thing we did was to record what, what this place was like before the war. We talked to, to the people who live there now. We recorded the traditional crafts and arts. We took videotapes and took pictures and samples and interviewed people. And everywhere we went, we saw the intersection between what the war was like here and what people were doing now. So here you see these women with a traditional woven mat. They are standing in front of the pillar of what was a, a Japanese air control tower. They work there because it's shady and cool. People are living in pillboxes, they are using uh, pieces of airplanes to hold, to store their water. Um, they get very annoyed because the old aircraft runways make it very hard to plant gardens. Um, they're living right in the middle, physically, of World War II. It's very interesting. Here you can see before and after. This is what Tarawa looks like today. It's a little piece of Malolap Atoll. It's, as you see, flat. There's still, they clear one runway to live on, but you see it's essentially unpopulated, really only a few dozen people. Here it is at the end of the war. It looks unpopulated. It's been bombed for two years, but um, the Japanese uh, soldiers are probably underground at this point trying to survive uh, the bombing. As you can imagine, this is a very interesting place to walk around. There are unexploded shells everywhere, um, bomb holes still. It's just a, a very odd part of the world because m in most places, the World War II debris and remains have been cleared off and made the areas made livable, but that's not true here. So if we look at what this looked like during the time of the Japanese air base, so there's a, the remains of an anti-aircraft gun um, still on the shore. But this is the American um, map from the, from the bombing era. And um, the archaeologist who worked with me had reconstructed. He took the modern island and went back to those old maps and reconstructed what is still uh, available to see. The, Marshall, uh, the Marshallese government has not taken action on this idea of an historic park, but I still think tourists would come. It's, it's still a little dangerous. It would have to be made, made a little safer for them. Anyway, as you can imagine, when I finished that project, I said, wow, 
I never knew anything about what happened to the Micronesians. Where were the Micronesians on Maloa Lab? Where did they go? Um, what happened to them? So when I came back, I went to the library and I saw hundreds and hundreds of volumes about American experiences during the war and hundreds of volumes about Japanese experiences during the war in Micronesia and nothing about Micronesian experiences during the war. So I said, this is a project that has to be done and it has to be done quickly because we are losing that older generation. So I began uh, with two colleagues to find funding for us to go and interview as many older people as we could uh, to record their memories. Here I'm talking to Mrs. Machiko Sorum and her mother who lived on Chuk uh, during the war. I tell you a little about this project. Um, I want to talk about this project because I very much want to encourage uh, the younger scholars especially to pursue oral history uh, because it is one of our resources that disappears so quickly with the passing of our older uh, generation. I worked with Suzanne Falgu at the University of Hawaii West Oahu. Uh, she speaks Pohnpeian and she worked on Pohnpeian Koshrai. I worked with Dr. Larry Carucci who was here visiting you last year. Uh, he speaks Marshallese and he worked in the Marshall Islands. Uh, our funding was from the U.S. National Endowment for the Humanities. We had a little bit of a quarrel with the historians because they could not see why anthropologists were doing this work and we said well you are doing it, historians, so we, you, we need to do it because we have the language and we know the area uh, very well. We had assistance from historic preservation offices and informants through, throughout Micronesia. People were very uh, welcoming and very excited to talk to us. They very much wanted this information recorded. Um, just show you two pictures. Uh, this is Xavier High School. It's the Jesuit High School um, on uh, Chuk, and it's very well known as the best private high school in Micronesia, and it is a World War II era building that in fact had a bomb embedded in the gym uh, ceiling. <laughs> I think it's safe for the students, however. Uh, here on the bottom right is one of many, um, in English it's called, kind of impolitely, bone collecting expeditions. It's a memorial expedition of Japanese uh, who travel through the islands in order to uh, collect the remains of the many thousands of Japanese soldiers who died during the war and they continue to try to do that in order to memorialize um, the dead. I did not have the language, my language in Micronesia is Pohnpeian, but Suzanne speaks it better than me. So by default I went to Chuk and Yap and because I do not speak those languages I worked through informants to do my work. So we had divided up the islands with Dr. Karuchi working here in the Marshalls, Suzanne working in Koshra and Pompeii, me working in Chuk and Yap. Luckily, there have been other researchers in Palau, in Guam, and in the northern Marianas Islands who have also done this work. So when we produced our final volume, we used their work as well. For those of you who are in the world of scholarship, you may be interested in how we did our project. The first uh, process, part of our research process, was to develop our questions. And this was tougher than you might think, because when you are talking with 70 or 80 year old uh, people in Micronesia, they often have not been off their island. They certainly have not read World War II history. So it didn't make any sense to ask them a question like, um, what was your life like at the beginning of World War II? Because for them, World War II began when they were personally affected, not when the no national politics changed, not at the time of Pearl Harbor or at the time of any specific event. It was rather when the Japanese army came ashore on their island or when the first American bombs fell on their village. That was the start of war. So we had to phrase our questions so that they were very personal. And then later our job would be to connect those personal memories with the historical accounts of the war. Locating survivors was the easiest. Micronesia is a place where everyone is kin to everyone else. And as soon as we made our first connections, people immediately found their relatives and helped us get there. Sometimes this meant a lot of travel across the lagoons. 
um, and hiking <laughs> and going back several times to find people, but that was a great pleasure. Recording the interviews, that was pretty straightforward. Translation, not so straightforward. Um, national grants never give you enough money for translation. It's a very difficult process and um, I am only partly happy with the translations I was able to accomplish. However, all of our recordings will be put into a library and so future generations of Micronesians themselves who have perfect language skills will be able to go back and retranslate things. At the end of our interviews, we interviewed more than 300 people. Then we all got together and put our interviews together and compared what was going on. So we wanted to know how was men's experience different from women's? How was it different if you lived in a city or if you lived out on the rural area? What was the difference if your family had Japanese relatives or Okinawan relatives or if you had no connections with the Japanese? What was life like if you lived next to an air base or a military installation or a navy center or if you lived far away from those uh, areas? Um, what was your life like if you were invaded by the American Marines versus if you were an island that was bypassed for invasion. So we just compared all kinds of experiences during the war. Then uh, we did the historian part of our job where we took all the historical information about World War II and put it together with what people's stories were. So in the end, we had a chronology of what happened in Micronesia in the war that connected people's local experiences with what was happening internationally. Uh, let me give you a little example of that. Um, I remember talking to an old woman who said, oh, I remember the first thing I remember about the war is going to a, a big party that the Japanese had uh, where they had a parade and they were singing a song and she sang the song for me. And she couldn't remember when it was, she couldn't remember what the event was. And it wasn't until uh, a year later when I started to research the early stages of the war that I could connect her memories with um, an imperial proclamation that had to do with um, the establishment of how can I put it? the establishment of a particular general in charge of the East Asian portion of the war. And I had to connect those dots very carefully to understand how she as a child had gone to a parade and what that had to do with global war. These pictures, I want to show you a picture, a few pictures of the war, not to recount the history of the war, but to emphasize the amount of destruction that Micronesians experienced during the war. This is Chuk Lagoon. Uh, Chuk Lagoon was the center of the Japanese Imperial Fleet for several years. Um, it was also an oil uh, depot for the Japanese Navy, uh, and it was very heavily bombed during the war. Chuk was never invaded but the Americans and allies bombed it sometimes twice a day for uh, a year and a half. So very heavily bombed during the war. Here's the same place today, uh, 1990. <laughs> when I visited with Machiko Sorum, she could never quite find her house on this picture, but she knew it was there, somewhere under the debris and uh, smoke. Today this area is um, only occupied by a few families because it was so heavily uh, bombed that after the war the Americans declared it off limits for a long time and only recently have people begun to go back and start to live there. You can see some of the curbing for the old streets and so on. She could take me right to her house. Her father had been a Japanese policeman so they lived right in the Japanese town. Her mother was a Chukis woman and uh, she grew up um, part Japanese and part Chukis. And uh, she had very vivid memories as a child of nine or 10 of experiencing the bombing and uh, introduced us also to many older people who had been young adults during the war. So throughout this time period on Chuk, when I talked to people, I uh, spent a lot of time just trying to get a sense of what their lives had been like. This is Mr. and Mrs. Masataki Mori. Mr. Mori's father was a, a Japanese immigrant. Uh, Mrs. Mori's mother, was a, or father, was a Chukis chief. So they had married, and after the war, uh, Mr. Mori had to choose whether he was going to be Chukis or Japanese. Uh, 
He chose to be Chukis and stayed. His brother chose to be Japanese and left. And they did not reconnect until about uh, 15 years ago when they wrote to each other and uh, Mr. Mori was able to visit his brother. Uh, this is a, a bomb shelter. People were, took me to, um, oh, some people had old uh, tanks in their yards, or I mean, military tanks, not water tanks. And um, they would just show me the things around their houses or in their yards that were war remains. People use uh, bomb shelters now as typhoon shelters, or they use them for food storage. So everywhere you go, there are pieces of the war. Chuuk Lagoon is perhaps especially famous, since it was the combined fleet headquarters for the Japanese Imperial Navy. It has a, a huge lagoon in it, and uh, this is uh, me years ago with um, my assistant, actually Mr. Mori's son-in-law, uh, who s drove us back and forth across the lagoon, visiting people in different islands. Today, because of a Jap uh, an American air raid in uh, February 1944, the lagoon is uh, filled with Japanese aircraft and boats and is one of the world's premier diving spots. So it is a huge tourist attraction. And most foreigners on uh, Chuuk today are there for the diving. Um, this is what the Marshall Islands was thinking of with Maloa Lap, is a tourist attraction from World War II. I wanted to show you um, the result of this, both in terms of my work and in terms of Micronesia today. When um, we completed our research, we said, okay, there's a certain interest in just the history. I think history is important and should always be preserved. But as anthropologists, we also wanted to know what difference does this make in people's lives today? So we talk in our book about the three major changes that happened in Micronesia as a result of the war. First, the militarization and a broader understanding of how militarization affects a society. As you know, many parts of the world go in and out of a period of military readiness, and anthropology can use cross-cultural comparison to talk about how this changes a society. The combat and destruction, that's obvious in a way, but I think that there is still something to be learned about how people deal with the destruction of war and how they respond to it. We know that society is resilient, we know that people are creative, and how people respond to the destruction of combat and war I think is an important lesson for us. The longest term impact on Micronesia, of course, is that when the Japanese Empire ended, Micronesia came under new colonial control, at first under the United States and then eventually as independent nations. This change was a very dramatic one. It's hard to imagine two more different styles of governing than the Japanese style and the American style. There are very, very different kinds of governments and um, the Micronesian people had to deal with this shift almost overnight, sometimes literally <laughs> overnight. I have brought um, our book, The Typhoon of War, if any of you want to look at it. It will just give you an idea of the kinds of information that we tried to cover through our research. This tank is parked outside the tourist office in Pompeii. These are some pictures that will show you the, the range of the war in Micronesia. I'm sure this picture is familiar to you, but it reminds you that what happened in Micronesia was not about Micronesia just as what happened here in Taiwan was about more than Taiwan. It was about the entire Japanese Empire and uh, what the plan was, both civilian and military plan, uh, of the Japanese government. For Micronesians uh, who were not under Japanese uh, governance before the war, um, the first impact on Guam was the invasion and occupation. And, 1941, and that's a story that has been told by uh, Guam's historians. And the Guam, Guam, people of Guam remained under Japanese control, as did uh, the other areas invaded by Japan, until the American and British joint counterattack began 
and I don't want to get into the details of military history. Some people love them and some people are not too interested. But for our purpose, uh, let me mention that the Allied, which is the term for the American and British joint efforts uh, against the Japanese Empire, it took two tracks. One was through New Guinea, through to the Philippines, and the other was the one that went through Micronesia. So it was this track, which was largely the American Navy, that most affected Micronesia. It began in Tarawa on the Gilbert Islands, today Kiribati, with the first um, uh, Marine, the first Allied invasion and attack on British territory. Um, these are some disturbing pictures, and I want to emphasize, try to look at them from the point of view of the local native people living on the island. These were people who had not traveled very much, who had not been involved with large-scale military activity, and who suddenly had this invasion happening on their land. This is what Tarawa looked like after the successful uh, Allied invasion. And you can see it's an atoll, and it's essentially destroyed. The same thing then happened in parts of the Marshall Islands, where uh, people woke up one morning, as they said, they looked out, and there were so many ships they could have walked from one ship to another. There were uh, literally thousands of ships showing up on their doorstep, and uh, literally thousands of planes dropping bombs on their uh, lands one day. So parts of the Marshall Islands were invaded, these are American Marines, and you see the landscape completely destroyed. People gone underground in order to protect themselves. And then the Marshallese uh, survivors here on Enomitok and Majuro being picked up by the Americans. This is what I mean when I said people's lives changed overnight. So one day they were Japanese, citi not citizens, but Japanese subjects in the Japanese Empire. The invasion happens the next day there. American subjects. The American military spent a long time thinking about how to handle Micronesians. Would they consider them prisoners of war? Uh, would they consider, how would they consider them? And they decided to consider them liberated peoples, so they were not uh, imprisoned or put into co uh, prisoner of war camps. They were um, assisted and uh, as soon as possible return to their islands. That was a very important decision. And as you'll see, it's not a decision that was made everywhere, but it, it, uh, it enabled the Marshall Islanders to recover much faster than people in the rest of Micronesia from the war. Because in the Marianas, in Western Micronesia, things were much more complicated for the Americans. In Western Micronesia, um, the Chamorro people in the Marianas were much more closely associated with, I'm sorry, let me go to that in a minute, much more closely associated with the Japanese. Some of them were uh, working for the Japanese or serving in the Japanese army, and Americans had to make some different decisions about whether they would be considered prisoners of war or liberated peoples. There were many islands in between that were not invaded. They were just bombed for the last part of the war, and that was uh, Chuk, Pompeii, Koshrai, uh, those islands. You have to remember that the folks on uh, Chuk, for example, I think I could say I never met anyone on Chuk who had met an American until after the war. So their experience of Americans until 1945 was that Americans are bombing us. So it was very frightening for them when the American military came ashore in October of 1945. They had no idea what to expect. Here is uh, Yap, again, subject of bombing. And then uh, Western Micronesia when it was invaded. Again, I'm, just, I'm not trying to give you a history of the war, but just show you the level of destruction and impact on people's lives. The pretty town of Garapan that we saw earlier was completely destroyed. And in fact, uh, after the invasion, the American government decided to just bulldoze it completely, which some people are still mad about, <laughs> um, rather than try to restore it. <laughs> 
by now, by this period of time, late in the war, uh, the people of the Marianas were suffering from starvation uh, and a great deal of bombing, and it was just a very stressful, horrible, unhappy time for them, as it was for people here, and of course for people in most of East Asia. As I said, the Americans made some different decisions um, about how they would treat Micronesians in the West, and uh, the Chamorros, the native people of the Marianas, uh, ended up in uh, a camp. They didn't call it a prisoner of war camp, so they were not with the Japanese military or even the Japanese civilians. They were in a separate camp, but they were kept under security for another uh, year and a half before they were free to leave. So today you will find that people in the Marianas and Western Micronesia have not quite a 100% positive memory of the Americans during the war. Uh, Guam, however, um, felt very much that they had been oppressed by the Japanese and uh, that they were very glad to see the Americans uh, come ashore again at the time of um, the invasion of Guam in July 1944. So the stories from Guam are all very, very uh, positive about the end of the war. Here is a combat patrol where the Chamorros, who most of whom on Guam spoke English, immediately began to work with the American military uh, to uh, ensure the uh, victory of the Americans. Part of what happened that created a long-lasting impact on Micronesia then was first you had the period of Japanese militarization, then you had the American victory, then you had American militarization because America was still prosecuting the war against Japan and as soon as they conquered a Micronesian territory they said how can we use this to move closer to Japan so they took over Japanese air bases in the Marshalls and began flying bombing missions further west in Saipan uh, they immediately built and took over the Japanese air bases and expanded them so that Japan could be bombed directly In Ulithi, which is a small atoll, it became the American fleet headquarters. So uh, people in Ulithi who were not at all used to visitors uh, became used to uh, hundreds of thousands of visitors. Uh, here's an example of m many pictures from the U.S. Navy photographers who loved the contrast between local people and high military technology. There are many, many such pictures. And I find it ironic because the pictures try to contrast, um, oh, perhaps they think they're simple or primitive people with the high tech, but if you actually talk to the people, they understood quite well what was going on and what it was all about. You know that the bomb that uh, destroyed Hiroshima and uh, Nagasaki flew from um, Tinian in the Western Marianas. So that's another Micronesian connection with history. Today there is a marker at the airfield to commemorate that. And uh, the activists, the local Chamorro activists who um, try to demilitarize the Marianas uh, use this as one of the places that they hold uh, protests today. So the end of war brought a complete change of government across Micronesia. Whether people experienced the end of war as a liberation and as freedom and as positive assistance from the Americans, or people who experienced the end of war as uh, a traumatic, uh, unhappy loss of their Japanese connections, um, whatever their attitude was, it was a complete transformation for everybody. Here is in Saipan the raising of the American flag, and this happened everywhere uh, in the Micronesian region. When people remember this time, they remember the transfer of power. Their stories are very poignant and very evocative of what their attitudes were. So in some places, it was all, we were so glad to see the Japanese leave, we were good riddance to them, it was, it was wonderful to see them uh, get on the boat and leave. In other places, it, it, it was so sad, uh, we, we loved them, they were our friends, um, we were so sorry to see them go, it was, it was very hard to say goodbye. So the feelings were strong, but varied uh, in different areas. After the war, as you know, the United States took control under the United Nations of this region, and uh, the military has never really left Micronesia after the Japanese military in the late 1930s. So the first administrators for the Americans were the U.S. Navy. Then when it became a civilian administration, the U.S. military retained an interest in the area 
Um, although the night throughout the 1950s, it was a peaceful time for people, it was also a time um, when there was not much money around. The American uh, government wanted to retain control of the area, but didn't want to spend money to develop it. Uh, was not interested in an empire the way the Japanese were, did not encourage commercial development, would not allow Japanese or Okinawan businessmen to return. So people felt after the war that they had lost a great deal of economic prosperity and they did not have much in exchange for it. The U.S. military remained interested in Micronesia. As you know, they used parts of the Marshall Islands for nuclear testing, uh, resulting in um, the removal of Marshallese from some islands, resulting in health problems that continue to today, and those legal issues and moral issues continue to affect U.S. Marshallese relationships. Uh, part of the result is that today the U.S. government continues to supply uh, economic support to the Marshallese, and Marshallese are also free um, to migrate to the United States, so that is a special relationship the U.S. has with them. By the 1970s and 1980s, um, just like every place else in the world that was a colony, the areas of Micronesia were ready to become independent and began to ne negotiate for independence and uh, to vote, uh, to have their own statuses. But within the region, there were considerable tensions. So you had uh, people on the small islands who wished for a more traditional life, who did not want to be involved in the global economy, uh, who wanted to be uh, freer to determine their own community's life. And you had people, for example, in Saipan or the Marianas, who very much wanted to be part of the global economy and wanted to be part of the global market. And um, if they could, wanted to be part of uh, the United States. So in the end, the Northern Marianas split off and became the Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas Islands. It's part of the United States now. Uh, Guam has uh, its own status as a territory. If you look at the map, these places are so close, you say, why didn't they just join up together and become the 51st state? But think about World War II history. The Northern Marianas were part of the Japanese Empire, and they sided essentially with Japan in the war. Guam was never in favor of Japan and never a supporter of the Japanese Empire. So when the suggestion was made after the war that these two communities joined together, uh, it was impossible. The feelings were too strong and too negative. Other uh, areas became independent. The Republic of the Marshall Islands, the Federated States of Micronesia, which is that central Chuk, Pohnpei, Yap, uh, Koh Rai area, and most recently, uh, the Republic of Palau. The Republic of Palau took a longer time to become independent, not because they weren't ready, they were ready, but because they wanted a nuclear-free element in their um, constitution and the United States wanted to uh, have military access for its nuclear submarines. So that took a long time to work out. Uh, but again, it shows us how the role of the military shapes Micronesia, even today. So the impacts of the war today remain. If you go to any airstrip in Micronesia, it was probably first built in World War II, uh, almost certainly. The one in Chuk was uh, a famous Japanese airstrip. Uh, that I talked to many men who worked on that, who did the building of it, who remember <laughs> being out in the sun every day uh, under scarce rations and being bombed while they were trying to repair it. Uh, so the physical changes are throughout Micronesia. Their views of colonialism are very different from people who never experienced war on their land as a part of their colonial experience. The Japanese links, as soon as they were free to revive those, the islands of, of Micronesia uh, redeveloped their links with Japan, and today um, you will find Japanese businessmen and Japanese connections throughout most of Micronesia. It's, uh, although the military era was very negative for Micronesians, they remember the civilian era very positively, and so they have uh, many positive connections with Japanese relatives and friends and businessmen. The American links, though, are also positive. So uh, they continue to feel uh, that what they got out of American experience was more opportunities, more education, uh, a concept of democracy and freedom, and they appreciate those gifts also. Their strategic role continues to give them a very special role in the world. 
If you look at global events, of course, Palau or the Federated States of Micronesia are not big global players. But when they have a chance, they speak up for peace and they say, uh, we experienced the damages of war and we are here to tell you uh, it's our job to stand against it. And they have been active, I think, on the public stage in reminding everyone that um, the costs of war are not worth the uh, results of it. And I think they have taken that role very, very seriously. When you travel throughout Micronesia today, the memories of the war are different in different places because it depends on how people like to remember. In the United, in the United States, we like to build memorials. So Guam, which is part of the United States, has a war in the Pacific National Park and has some memorials. But Micronesians aren't big on building memorials. So they remember the war in different ways. They remember it through oral history. And I brought, I brought our book that's about how Micronesians remember the war, how they tell the stories of the war. They also remember it in dance and song. So there are several famous dances, including one that was used at the opening of the Federated States of Micronesia uh, National Building, which tell the story of the war through dance and through chants. And uh, down on the left, you remember people making kava when they sit around and talk. If there is an older person there, the younger people will ask for stories of the war. And it is this oral transmission from parent to child, grandparent to grandchild, that is the most important and most valuable way that Micronesians remember the war. I want to conclude by saying that exploring the war with Micronesians has really transformed my understanding of it. My father fought in the war in Europe, and my mother, like so many people, spent her time during the war um, struggling with the economy and worrying about my father coming home. But the war did not seem as immediate to me because it was not fought on my land. When I worked with the Micronesians, I understood much more um, the power of history to shape our future and the importance of people who lived through these experiences in speaking about uh, preserving the peace for the next generation. So thank you all. I'll be glad to take questions. <laughs>